five, four, three, two, one, contact. Hello and welcome back to Project Horizon. My name's Mark, and the video you just saw was, in my opinion, one of the best flights we had with the Hussar program. Let's get into it. So, quick recap. This is part two of a three-part series I'm doing, all about how I went from pretty much starting from nowhere to being able to land my own model rocket. Part one was about the mock program, which is just a proof of concept for TVC. Could I actually prove to myself that I could get that rocket up in the air and kind of go somewhat straight up? Part two, this is what this video is about, is Hussar. It's all about reliable TVC control. And then, of course, part three is going to be wrapping it all up and landing the rocket. So this is Hussar. It is my only TVC rocket that's not broken right now, so... The time being, it's my favorite TVC rocket. Big thanks to my brother. He actually came up with this flight insignia. Uh, we did a couple fun things in there. We have some Polish heritage in the family. So if you see the cool things we put in that insignia, please leave a comment below. Uh, we need to see if you get it. So I devised a sort of a test for myself that I would know if the rocket was stable enough to move on. And that test revolves around this Apogee F10 motor. It's a lot different than the F15 motors that I've been using lately. Um, Really, these are great. They're from Estes. I've never actually had a problem with them. I think I've launched like 80 of these things so far. These have about a three to three and a half second burn, while as these F15, or excuse me, F10s have about a seven second burn. So I figured if the rocket can be stable for seven seconds, that was a really good test to know that the rocket was stable and that I could move on to landing the model rocket. So to get Hussar going up really reliably, we had to address the glaring problems of Mach, namely the wobbliness and the uncontrolled uh, stability on the way up. Now I had three main theories of what was going on. The first was I thought the rocket was having issues calculating its orientation, which could be derived from either the IMU or some parts and software. I also thought maybe the gimbal was acting weird, that the servos were weak and they weren't acting as expected because after all, they were really cheap plastic servos. And lastly, I thought the problem could be traced back to the control theory that I was sending bad command controls to the servos and that maybe they were weak or uh, too strong or something. So to tackle the first part of what I thought was causing the mock issues, I actually redesigned my flight computer entirely. So this is Mustang version two. Mustang was the upgrade from Warhawk and comment below if you see uh, kind of the theme I was going for on that one. I took all the Teensy 4.1 components and just put it all straight onto a PCB. So no more breakout components on this guy except for a radio board on the back. So I went ahead and I upgraded the IMU. The new IMU that I was using was the BMI 088, which is pretty good in high vibration environments. And I think it's usually uh, suggested for drone users. So I thought it'd be something great to add to the board. So on that note, Mustang actually flew on Mach. It actually flew on the very last two flights. Um, didn't fly great. So at least knowing that we can check off that it was a bad IMU for my list of kind of three theories I had. I also slightly upgraded my gimbal. Um, I kind of swapped out those Amazon cheap plastic servos for something a little bit more robust with metal gearing. Uh, it definitely looked like it helped every time I sent it a command that arm would actually stop kind of where I wanted it to instead of kind of bouncing. So pretty good for uh, at least the gimbal that way. For flights one and two of Hussar actually, I upgraded the flight software. So instead of using the accelerations to figure out where the rocket was feeling gravity and calculate orientation based on that, I swapped to Quaternion, so basically integrating your gyroscopes to get orientation of the rocket and way more reliable than just doing acceleration, especially for a moving body. Now, unfortunately, flights one and two still had some issues, but we were starting to knock off the probable causes for flight instability, and you'll see pretty soon that it started to pay off. So after Hussar's first and second flight, I went home and I started banging my head against the wall. Uh, not literally, but started wondering what was going on because I remember thinking to myself, for this to really work, the rocket needs to know where it's at and we need to send the proper commands or control commands. So I was really confident the rocket knew where it was. So I started thinking about the control commands and that's where <laughs> the realization came in as to 
the dumb issue I did to myself. And that issue was in software. So again, don't do things you don't understand. And especially with just throwing a rocket up into the sky. But anyway, the problem was I ended up taking zero to 255, which was the output of the PID library that I was using. And for some reason, I thought I should map that to zero to nine degrees, which again, just doesn't make sense. But this is the snippet of code that was screwing up everything. And once I realized that that was probably wrong, um, I kind of went deeper into the PID control theory and realized I should have just taken that output number and sent it straight onto the servos. And that's exactly what I did. As a result, flight three looked like this. Holy yes. shit. Parachutes, parachutes, parachutes. No, oh, thank God. <laughs> So we're so excited. It finally went up straight. It looked really cool. It kind of veered to the right a little bit and that's just because of wind, but the data looked great. The video looked great. Everything looked great. And finally I felt that I was in a position to advance instead of being all wobbly with the rocket. We were at a point where it was going up straight and I could start having fun with this. So flights four and five, we just had a lot of fun. We sent it up again and flight six, just to test it a little bit, I put in a 10 degree set point. Um, just to see how well the rocket would hone into it. And it looked really cool, except when the chutes didn't really deploy and it crashed. So with Flight 3 success and the cool stuff we learned from 4, 5, and 6, I decided to throw on an F-10 engine onto it. And it went pretty well. So flight seven looked really good. Uh, I'm not gonna say it developed a wobble. It was just tiny, it was a little bit of a wiggle. So we had a little bit of a wiggle going up, no big deal. Um, flight eight looked phenomenal. Um, again, just like a hair of a little deviation based off of uh, the orientation, but looked really good. Um, from that point, I mean, that gold standard was achieved. Uh, I just, again, cause this is what I do. I, I, I meet my goal and I want a little bit more. So I actually came across the BPS space video on Sprint and he actually transferred from an angle base to a torque base controller. And I think it's a really great idea because if you can see on flight seven and eight that it kind of acts a little bit differently early on versus later on with the control of it. Um, it's a little bit more snappy early on and it's a little bit more lethargic later on. And that's because your thrust is actually changing because you kind of have a hyperbolic decline in your thrust curve. And the best way to kind of adjust for that is from going to an angle based controller, which is just the output of your PID controller's angle. And you throw that back to your servo to where the output of that controller becomes torque. And you actually use your uh, moment arm and your known thrust to calculate where the angle of the servo should be. So flights nine, 10 and 11 were just kind of a mess. Nine, the engine actually blew up and that's cause these F10 motors can be a little, little finicky. They're great, but you know, they have some issues now and then. And there's another one I'll get to. Um, but 10 and 11 were my fault. I had some bad control gains and I did something dumb in the simulation as well, which is basically you need to match kind of that update frequency of the Simulink block to your uh, like loop timing basically. So those both have to line up and I just forgot to do that and my gains were bad. Flight 12, I went back to the Estes F-15. I was kind of just, I didn't want to waste any more F-10s. They're just a little bit more expensive. So F-15 went great. I fixed the bug in the simulation. I did better gains and everything looked fine. And then I moved to the Apogee again, F-10, and that flight looked phenomenal as well. At this point, I was just kind of ending the year with some fun. I, I, I launched a few more times. So flight 14 was really cool, except the F-10 went into a unknown turbo mode where you can see in the data, just it goes through the roof. So rocket did its best to correct, but I put an abort function in all my rockets. If it deviates more than 45 degrees from vertical, it just pops the chutes um, for situations like that. And then flight 15 was a lot of fun. It was the first time I put a camera on the uh, rocket with an F-10 motor on it. It's really cool to see how it stabilizes and it doesn't like it doesn't do it aggressively it does it nice and smooth and it actually kind of hovers near the top because there's just so much mass on the rock with the with the camera on it so really happy with how that turned out um really happy with the fast progression through hisar now you notice in a few of these videos we're really hyper obsessed with shoots all of a sudden parachutes 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 no oh thank god 
Shoots, shoots, shoots. So the problem was, um, when you have a MOSFET, they kind of act a little bit like a capacitor on the gate. And as you charge that gate up so that it actually can open, you pull a lot of current from that pin. And I don't know if it was either pulling way too much current that the Teensy 4.1 MCU couldn't handle, but I do know that putting a resistor on the gate of the MOSFET actually fixed the problem. So this was cool to figure that out. Finally, it was worrying me for a bit and that was massively fundamental to Eagle because for you to land a model rocket properly, you need to be really, really trusting in your MOSFET turning on so that that secondary motor can light. So that's all I got for Hussar. Hussar was a lot of fun. We were pretty quick to get into our goal, uh, again, fixing the issues of stability that originated from Mach, and got that rocket going straight up, and actually, as a bonus, got the torque base controller integrated into the software. So really reliable, really happy all that came together, and started having a lot of fun when the rocket actually went up, looking like a rocket. So next video is gonna be over Eagle, um, this poor soul right here. Uh, we tried to go for extra landings that day, and I have had 32 successes in the secondary motor igniting, and on the 33rd, it didn't, which is really sad because I thought it had a solid chance of landing again the same day. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, let's go home. Um, instead, we smushed it. So, um... Up to that point, I'll explain how everything was working, and uh, yeah. So thanks for watching, um, and thanks for the support. <laughs> As an engineer who really appreciates just coding and hanging out, uh, designing parts, uh, never thought that editing the videos would actually be this much fun. So thanks for all the support, thanks for watching, and uh, my name is Mark, this is Project Horizon, and I will see you next time.